Lately, I've been thinking a lot about how to make video games scary, because apparently that's what my brain does instead of making good decisions. Or producing serotonin. So with an excuse to catch up in the series, over the last two weeks I've played Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, slash Biohazard 7, Resident... E I've played Evil Bio Resident 7 Hazard, Bio Re 2 Hazard Evil Resident 2 and The Chamber of Secrets, and uh, the first one as well, also. So while my goal for this video is to take a look at some of the common mistakes I feel most horror games make and offer some thoughts on how they could be improved upon, I'm going to derive most of my examples off the Resident Evil series, just because that's what I've been playing. I'm sorry Resident Evil, I still love you and I hope you can forgive me. Mwah. Now, before I go any further, yeah, I acknowledge that fear is pretty much about as subjective as things get. There are some things that terrify me to the very core of my being that other people literally jerk off to. So I'm going to try to avoid things like atmosphere or pacing or anything else you could learn in a horror 101 class and try to focus on mechanical ways to add that shit pantsing factor to your game. Alright, enough intro bullshit. Let's get on with the spooks! So, here's the sitch. You're trapped in what can only be described as an obnoxiously haunted house and this spooky old lady wants to catch you so that she can, uh... Look, she's just a fucking asshole, okay? I told you to stay out of here! <laughs> Here's a map of the area I made in the Duck Game level editor, because, well, I don't know how to use Adobe Illustrator. So, the goal is to solve this puzzle over here, to open a hidden door over here, and then get the fuck out of Bruges. Now, if you get caught, the punishment is an incredibly telegraphed jump scare, and then you get sent back, at most, one room. That's what's on the line here. A close-up and a door. Congratulations, Nintendo. Your AAA multi-million dollar horror game is officially less intimidating than any turn in XCOM. Wanna know the most scared I've ever been playing a video game? Fun story. You guys remember my friend James, who was an asshole? Well, when we play Smash, we like to call out things or topics to pick our characters based off of. So, uh, characters you've never heard of, Trump versus Clinton, waifus, that sort of thing. Well, one game we decided the topic would be loser has to jerk off to the winner's character. So I picked the Wii Fit Trainer, but then switched it to the guy version. Now, guess who James, who was an what? asshole, picked? Now, I'm not suggesting the fail state of all video games should result in pedophilia. <laughs> but the unfortunate reality is that all game over screens really do is kill momentum. The stakes need to be higher. You need to be scared of something to be scared. Thank you, thank you, I deserve this. If you think about it, all that really happens when you die in a video game is you respawn 20 seconds later and now you've effectively become some sort of ethereal omnipotent demigod who can't die and sees 10 minutes into the future. Being scared comes from panic. And as soon as you can formulate a plan, you're no longer trying to survive. You're trying to succeed. I know it might sound counterintuitive, but maybe it would be better to try and keep the player alive. In Metal Gear Solid 3, when you... Oh, what, you thought I was going to go a whole video without talking about Metal Gear Solid? You must be fucking new here. When you're fighting the end, instead of regular gun juice, he uses tranquilizers. So you don't die, you just pass out. And then he takes you back to Granity Gorky, which is like 15, 20 minutes away. That's way worse than having to just restart a boss fight. But the end result is still just a loss in progress. So the question is, how do you keep the player from losing, but simultaneously up the ante? I think the answer is layered fail states. The absolute most panicked I was in the 50 plus hours I spent playing these things over the last two weeks was right here, where after a domestic with your wife, she... Tch, women, am I right? Okay. All right, calm down. Keep your waitresses. I kept waiting for a game over screen, which just never came. So like, do I just not have a hand now? Like for the rest of the game? Do I just have to deal with that? I mean, I lost an arm and Lisa the painful and the game kept chugging along. So me, oh no, we're just gonna literally staple it back on in the next scene. Cool. Didn't realize that all that went into limb reattachment was some duct tape and a positive attitude, but fuck it, why not? My point is that the permanent debuff of minus one entire arm was way more intimidating than having to restart a boss fight. And admittedly, that's a bit of a harsh punishment for one fuck up, but that's where the layered part comes in. 
So, you get punched in the face by old McDonald over here, but instead of being politely informed of your own untimely death, instead you wake up trapped in some sort of torture chamber or something. Now you've got to figure a way out. Escape in time? Cool. Fuck it up. Your man comes in and starts trying to fucking poke you with shit. Now you have to fight him off. Fuck that up and then you suffer a permanent consequence. Maybe you get injured and now you can't run as fast or your aim is bobbly. Maybe a buddy comes in and saves you, but then they get killed and won't be around to bail you out later in the story or give you hints. And obviously you can't repeat the same set piece over and over, so if that same dude catches you again, maybe this time he straps a bomb to your arm. And now you've only got a few minutes to get it off. Get the bomb off in time? Cool. Fuck it up, maybe you lose an arm, and now you can't use shotguns, or tie your shoelaces. I know that might seem like a harsh punishment, but the fact that it's hidden under several layers of consecutive fuck-ups wouldn't make it seem unfair. Plus, you can adapt the difficulty around whatever debuffs the player has so they don't get stuck. Just don't tell them that. You want the player to feel helpless, but not actually be helpless. It's not like games don't do this all the time anyway. Resident Evil 4 straight up remuses a few enemies if you keep... D <laughs> Did I say remuses? <laughs> I've been drinking. Yeah, it gets rid of bad guys if you're shit. And it's not even restricted to combat, actually. In RE7, if you never found the dog head medallion thing in the book, they move it right under your nose later on so you don't get stuck. Now, you're probably thinking, Tom, you can't expect developers to design entire set pieces around every time you get caught. And also, you're yeah. so handsome. First of all, thank you. And secondly, not every enemy has to work like this. I'm not trying to suggest you do away with game over screens completely. If you get eaten by a Zambo, like, th that's the end of it, fair enough. But if the absolute worst thing these guys could do is make you reload a checkpoint, it will be even scarier whenever these guys show up, because now you're facing long-term consequences. And I understand the concern of designing traps and set pieces that some players won't see. Like, some people might never get captured, or escape here and finish the level before they have the chance to experience all of this stuff. Well, your honor, allow me to present to you the Undertale defense. Ladies and gentlemen of the, well, let's be real, overwhelmingly gentlemen of the YouTube, I would like you to leave me a comment saying whether or not you've ever heard of the game Undertale. Now, before you submit that comment and also subscribe and hit the bell and like and share this video and sacrifice them all time my honor, I have two further questions. If you have heard of Undertale, have you also heard of the genocide run? Okay, now, have you ever actually done a genocide run yourself? Something tells me your comment probably reads like, yes, I've heard of Undertale. Yes, I know about the genocide run. No, I haven't actually done one myself. Also, you're so handsome. Not every player has to experience every part of your game for them to appreciate it. With things like Reddit, YouTube, or just the internet in general, every option or alternate path is going to be discovered and uploaded somewhere. Undertale is an objectively better game for having the Sans fight in it. And although I'll probably never do it myself, because fuck this, the fact that there's so much more of the game that I would never have known otherwise makes it all the more impressive. I know it's fun to shit on David Cage, but when I was playing Emotion Simulator 2010 edition, I never got captured by this creepy doctor guy. I found what I needed and got out completely unscathed. Finding out what could have happened made the scene way scarier in retrospect than if it were a mandatory set piece. Things are less scary when you know they're supposed to happen. So, I think I've proven without a shadow of a doubt that the optional branching paths approach is a flawless strategy and that this idea is objectively infallible. Uh, what about the overwhelming cost of- Objectively infallible! Oh, I'm sorry, Plus, if you're making a horror game, it's generally better to focus on replayability rather than length. It's too hard to keep someone scared for 18 hours straight. Eventually, these guys are going to stop looking like horrific flesh-eating monsters and more like obstacles to be drifted around. I think a better approach is to really focus on being scary the first playthrough, but giving loads of incentive to go back later. There's a reason Resident Evil 2 starts like this and ends with a giant piece of tofu wearing a beret. Like... Mr. X is fucking scary. Ah, here. What the... Oh, sick, I got the cheese. <laughs> wait, no, please, please, wait for my mana. But anyone who's played the game can tell you how quickly he becomes more of a nuisance than an actual threat. One minute, he's this hulking juggernaut out for blood, and the next, he's the bumbling love child of Thanos and Inspector Gadget who can't tag you because you're in den. Actually, that's another thing I wanted to touch on. The longer you play a game, the more you'll pick up on some of the non-verbally communicated rules. 
Like, bad guys can't enter safe rooms, liquors can't go through doors, people who play Jigglypuff are cowards. What we've got here is a perfect opportunity to betray player trust. Imagine the first four or five times X gives it to you, you duck into a safe room and he doesn't follow you in. You've now been conditioned to believe that safe rooms are exactly that. Safe. Room. So what if the sixth time you meet him, you run back into a safe room, thinking you got away, and then... So obviously there's the initial panic, but there's also a degree of violation. There was this unspoken agreement between you and Nick Valentine that he doesn't follow you into safe rooms. Now he's just up and changed the rules, because fuck you. Now, in addition to needing therapy, you'll never feel safe in a safe room for the rest of the game. I mean, Resident Evil 1 spent the entire game conditioning you into thinking these were just loading screens, and then in Resident Evil 2... And that's all it takes. One time for that trust to be broken and you'll never feel safe again. It's kind of like in... Well, now that I think about it... Gonna have to go with... Metal Gear Solid, bitches! You know this guy? The fucking, uh, the... Uh, whose footprints, footprints are these? Yeah, he's the only guard in the entire game who can recognize footprints in the snow. And that's like a thing. It's literally just this one guy. That shit stays with you. So even if you only let the game break its own rules one time, it's still a big moment. I think the perfect example of something like this would be breaking the pause screen. A lot of the time when people get spooked, they pause the game in a panic. But that panic only lasts a second. If one time, whatever it was that was chasing you reached through the pause screen and said some shit like, that won't save you now, that shit would... Oh god damn it, you son of a bitch, I hate these things! Uh, so it's cool to start your game off as a scared little baby and then be fucking power bombing dudes by the end, but try to follow the alien curve, where they start and they're, they're just, they're fucked, but then they slowly develop a plan and they get progressively less fucked, but then it strip it all away at the last second so they're super fucked just before the end. Next, try to keep your monster designs human, like this guy is scary because you can sort of reverse engineer with your eye how he used to be like you, but now he's got a whole fucking situation going on. Like, this is scary, this is just... <laughs> Honestly, I think if I was trapped in a room with this guy in real life, I would roll my eyes. Next. Combat and movement should be a little clunky, but more deliberate. So like, slow attacks, good. Close up camera, good. I like the fixed camera and tank controls in Resi 1 because it's easy to fuck up if you panic. Uh, my older brother thinks that's bad game design, but he's an idiot who knows nothing. Wow. Boom. Next. At risk of sounding like Revolver Ocelot, the Cult Single Action Army is the best weapon in horror. It takes ages to reload, it's powerful, but it doesn't hold a lot of shots, and either fires really slowly or way too fast. So if you panic, you might- <laughs> God fucking- Damn it! Ugh, I had a whole thing about fourth wall breaks I wanted to talk about. Uh, well, that's all the time we have for today, I guess. So, uh, join us next time when our topic will be... Why jump scares are overrated. Spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. Spooky, scary skeletons speak with such a screech. You'll shake and shudder in surprise when you hear these zombies shriek. We're so sorry,